So I've been given the task of talking about violating the principles of RIF and how to avoid complications in, in upper extremity surgery. I have a tremendous amount of information that I'm trying to try to hit the high points within 10 minutes. I'm going to focus more on proximal humerus fractures and then hit upon maybe some humeral shaft fractures and how to avoid complications in treating these surgically. So I have no financial ties to any company. No funding has been obtained for any parts of this lecture. And permission was obtained from all of the patients for uses of their images in this presentation. I have no uh, stock in the gynecologic restaurant, thank God. I'm sure it did not do very well uh, when it came out. So learning objectives are a, a quick uh, literature review and review, you know, reasons for failure of proximal humerus fracture or RIF, RIF and shaft fractures and kind of briefly touching on distal humeral fractures. So here's a case example of a 47-year-old female who had a three-part proximal humerus fracture. She's one year out. She's pain. She's stiff. She's weak. She has decreased range of motion. And here's her implant. She has a proximal humerus plate with a uh, peg uh, construct. She has escape of her greater tuberosity. Her fractures in varus. She has penetration and what looks like uh, some post-traumatic DJD. And how can we avoid this type of scenario? Here's another case, 35-year-old male three-part uh, proximal humerus fracture involving the greater tuberosity and surgical neck. Was it truly a three-part proximal humerus fracture? Was it involving the surgical neck? Was it an ORIF or was it an OIF? We just put the implant in where the fracture laid. That's what we're going to try to avoid. Here, he's, here he is at three months post-op, penetration, head looks dysvascular. Oh, shit, what do we do now? 35 years old, what can we do to avoid these types of situations? So why did we get this extra? We have to understand, first of all, what is the implant that we're using? What type of fracture are we working with? What is the biology? Because in essence, what we want to do is have a stable reduced fracture, which is able to tolerate early physical therapy. Tuberosity repair in the shoulders is absolutely critical. We have to make sure that our surgical neck is reduced to avoid varus and they have appropriate medial calcar support. So this implant, which I don't even know if it's still out on the market, was initially used for distal radius fractures, kind of an intramedullary implant, is contraindicated when you have absence of our medial calcar. So understand what you're using. And, and Dr. Maida talked about, you know, technology and, and implants, and you can still do a great job with standard implants, and I use this analogy a lot. It's the, it's the Indian, not the arrow. So if you do a poor job and use a phenomenal implant, it will still fail. Jack Nicholas can shoot par using persimmon woods, and Barry Bonds can hit a home run off of you with a wiffle ball bat, blindfolded and drunk, without HGH. So what is the Indian, not, you know, not the arrow? It's what you do and what you make your implants do that will make your fracture fixation work. So imaging is extremely important. We need a good trauma, near trauma series when evaluating the shoulder, which is an AP axillary and scapular Y views. If the patient's unable to obtain an axillary, you can try a trauma axillary or a Velpo axillary. And be diligent about getting good x-rays in, in, in your office or from the emergency department. Uh, and when that doesn't help, uh, CT scanning of proximal humerus fractures is invaluable. It can help determine whether or not there's surgical or non-surgical methods necessary. It also can help you in determining types of surgical treatment, how much of the medial calcar is involved, is in there an interarticular split, if there's comminution on the tuberosity. So good x-ray evaluation is paramount. And that's the bottom line when you're assessing for surgery for these types of fractures. So the proximal humeral fracture literature with locking plates. You know, in all the literature, there's an unexpectedly high cutout rate and revision surgery. So locking plates are not a panacea. Everyone likes new implants. I'll put a plate on it. It'll do great. Well, if you look at, you know, these, these well-trained trauma surgeons, they have 36% radiographic complications, and there's an increased risk in patients above 60 years of age. So in what patient population gets fragility fractures, proximal humerus fractures or fragility fractures, those above the age of 60? So more literature. What are the risk factors in, in failure of locking plate fixation with proximal humerus fractures? Comminution, smoking, three-part fractures. Pretty much all of my patients in Delaware County, they all smoke about two packs of reds a day. They drink their face off. They might be 55, but they're more 85. So these are, these are a problem. These are a burden in our society and a burden in our offices. It's hard for them to get to heal. It's hard for them to fix. So how can we avoid it? Intraoperatively, when these patients have been taken back for fixation or repeat fixation or revision, whether it's to ORIF or arthroplasty, we found locking screw pullout, 
articular surface penetration of the screws, glenoid screw penetration from the articular surface penetration due to settling of the fracture, and even locking plate displacement, the plates pulling off of the bone, whether it be due to bad biology, bad surgical technique, or bad implants. So the potential risks of proximal humerus locking plate fixation and also percutaneous pinning, which I'll go over briefly, are malunion, hardware failure, non-union, articular penetration, post-traumatic DJD, AVN, and so on and so forth. So with proximal humerus locking plates when working with the proximal humerus, you can get a false sense of good purchase into the osteoporotic humeral head. You can get cut out very easily, especially superiorly with your screws. You can get AVN from the injury itself if you don't understand the personality of the fracture, or you can get AVN from your stripping or from the fact that you got articular penetration of your screws. You can get articular surface compromise, which can cause post-traumatic degenerative joint disease. So with closed reduction percutaneous pinning, if you, use, if you have an unstable fracture, there are unstable constructs that you would not want to use percutaneous pinning. You need good bone in young patients. You have to look out for nerve injury, and you have to look out for infection. Infection in the shoulder is underappreciated. They're not all purulent. So any patient that comes in with an early failed shoulder and a relatively well-reduced fracture, think about infection. So percutaneous pinning, when, it, when is it utilized? It's very difficult. It's a, it's a pain in the butt to do, but it's something that's in your armamentarium. And if you're going to use it, you should probably use it in stable two-part fractures. Surgical necks are probably the easiest to do it in. Patients with good bone, avoid the Farris fracture or the fracture with medial calcar uh, uh, abnormality, and you should have it in appropriate patients who, could, who can follow their post-op course. So this is a patient with a four-part valgus impacted fracture, obviously done within 10 days. The European literature states you can do this within 10 days. So here you see your fluoroscopic shoes. It's extremely important to, once again, reduce the fracture. So here we go using special percutaneous tamps to reduce the fracture. Our calcar is now reduced. The head is above the tuberosity. Now we're putting our pin in along the calcar. We put in percutaneous screws, reducing our surgical neck and our greater tuberosity. And here's our final a construct, so success. So in conclusions, perk pinning is a viable option. You want to make sure you use it in patients with good bone and the appropriate fracture type. You have to reduce the fracture properly, and you want to decelerate their rehab. So cervical neck fractures, which are ones that are amenable to cervical intervention? The ones that are common, that are unstable, and reduction is not appropriate. They usually require fixation. The calcar, or medial comminution, it typically puts the fracture in the varus. They get prominent tuberosities. They either go in the non-union or malunion, where they get significant and subacromial impingement and poor function in stiff shoulders. So the varus fracture is the one you really need to, to watch out for. The deforming forces across the fracture and the instability along the calcar will pull it into varus. Locking plates are excellent fixation techniques for this type of fracture. Pinning is not an issue. You still can get AVN based upon your medial calcar or how much stripping is involved with the fracture. So it's important to understand the personality of your fracture. Ralph Hurdle and JSC has published an excellent study in predicting ischemia to the humeral head. If you have a combination of these three things, length of your medial calcar segment less than eight millimeters, loss of integrity of the medial hinge, and an anatomic neck fracture, your risk of AVN is 97%. So you may want to consider on those bridge patients that you might want to do an arthroplasty rather than trying to fix them. So locking technology, it's new on the horizon. It came out when I was a resident. I graduated in 2003. I had a hell of a lot more hair back then. It was referred to as the Philos plate in the European literature. It came out by Synthes. It was shown to have promise for two, three, and some four-part fractures. It's been noted to be a stronger construct and useful in osteopenia based upon the previous literature. But bad bone is bad bone. Not, the implant will not correct bad bone, and it is not a panacea. And what do I mean by that? The current indications for locking plate fixation are your fracture pattern, two, three, and four part fractures, varus fractures, valgus impacted fractures that are greater than 10 days out, osteoporotic uh, uh, fragility fractures that are displaced, comminuted fractures of the proximal humerus, and failed non-op treatment. So locking plate fixation has, has helped us with improved fixation, contoured plate that's better uh, uh, for the proximal humerus anatomy. Multiple sites of fixation, these locking screws act as little blade plates and the locking technology which gave greater pullout strength in osteoporotic bone. But it's still the Indian, not the arrow. You can't just do an oif, put the plate on, the fracture's not reduced, putting screws wherever they need to be. You need to fix the fracture properly.
So you have to be aware of your calcar comminution. You have to be aware of the varus fracture. You have to be aware of your medial hinge and your tuberosity to head construct. This is a well-reduced cervical neck fracture. The fracture is reduced. The medial calcar is, is appropriate. You have enough uh, screws above and below uh, stabilizing the fracture to allow for range of motion post-op. So our setup, you make sure when you're doing these cases that you have an appropriate setup. I use beach chair. I use a delta pectoral approach. Some of the slick trauma guys in the room might do a lateral approach and do percutaneous fixation techniques. I get a little bit worried about the uh, axillary nerve, and I don't ever do a great job laterally reducing these cervical neck fractures. You have to be, uh, have the appropriate equipment in the room, K-wires, sutures, plates, plates that you're good with. And bone graft. Bone graft is paramount when treating proximal humerus fractures. I bring the floor up above the, the ipsilateral aspect of the shoulder and make sure I get good views before I start my, my, my uh, technique. Operatively, landmarks are important. Understand where your biceps is. That leads you to the rotator interval. By knowing where your interval is, you can tell where your tuberosities are. Peck insertion can give you a good idea of where your tuberosity uh, should, should sit. Coracoid can make sure you can stay away from neurovascular injury, and the axillary nerve uh, is important to palpate uh, laterally and posteriorly so you can avoid injury to that area. Gain control of your tuberosities. Open up the interval, put sutures through the, the greater and the lesser, and also through the superior cuff. You can tenedise your biceps, and the rotator cuff sutures can help with fixation of your tuberosities later, and also with reduction, and also with augmenting your stability of your construct. Work within your fracture plane. Stick a cob, stick a curved tamp within your fracture plane. Usually the fracture plane is posterior to the intertubercular groove, so you can elevate the head. Here's a patient with a uh, impacted fracture where the cob has elevated the head, you've restored your medial hinge and your tuberosity to the head uh, distance. You want to restore your, your, your relationships. Anatomic is best. When in doubt, put it in, in a little bit of varus. Correct varus uh, disease or, or correct valgus disease. Restore your version. Thir 20 to 30 degrees is appropriate. Restore your head to tuberosity distance because that will help your rotator cuff function properly. And if there's comminution, make sure that your medial hinge is reduced and you have to restore your calcar integrity, either with screws or augmented with bone graft, whether it be chips, putty, or uh, a bone peg. So fracture management, you need to have good locking screws into your head. Make sure these screws are less than 45 to 50 millimeters because these fractures will settle. So what I do is when I put my screws in or I measure them, I take off about four to six millimeters. Be aware of your post row superior screw because that's where you can get penetration. You need to have a good kickstand screw or multiple screws along the inferior calcar to withstand the deforming forces into varus along that calcar region. So your suture management is critical. You fix the proximal humerus, you put your plates on. There have been multiple studies that have shown that sutures within the tuberosity for tuberosity to tuberosity fixation and then sutures through the cuff through the plate have helped with torsional strength and increased stability and stiffness of your construct to allow for post-op range of motion because that in essence is what we want to do. So here we have our plate on. We have sutures through the cuff anteriorly, superiorly, and posterior superiorly, which is uh, attached to the plant which increases your construct stability. So here's some case examples. Here's a patient with a uh, three-part variant articular split. It's in varus. Here's after we reduced it, so our calcar is reduced. We have appropriate sagittal alignment. We have enough screws along the calcar and spread of our sutures superiorly. And we have an appropriately length plate to offset our calcar integrity. So the results of proximal humerus locking plates Improved healing and outcomes, but complications can occur secondary to osteopenia, calcar dysfunction, and comminution. So it's not 100%. Uh, uh, predicting failure with locking plate fixation. Uh, basically, bone mineral density, patient age, medial calcar reduction is extremely important. So make sure your calcar is reduced. Older patients have poor bone, and older patients have poor bone mineral density. So may, there may be nothing that you can do to make these from not heal. So try to avoid complications as much as possible. These are still difficult to treat, even with a locking plate. Not all fractures need a plate. Sometimes non-surgical or suture management is appropriate. There is a high rate of complication, especially in the elderly and in those who are osteopenic. Thank you.
So surgical techniques when I treat proximal humerus fractures are based upon age, bone stock, and activity. If you're plating them, make sure you elevate your angle, recreate your neck shaft angle, bone graft. I bone graft all of my patients. I reconstruct the tuberosities anatomically. I use multiple sutures in the, in the tuberosities in the cuff and augment it to the plate. I use bone graft, whether or not I use cancellous chips with DBX. Sometimes there's putties out there. Some people will use bone pegs. You can use bone pegs. I use them only for non-unions. And you want to use a plate of an appropriate length. Not everyone needs a three-hole plate. If you have calcar comminution or extension in the shaft, you want to make sure you have at least three to four screws below that area to withstand the forces. And do not make too stiff of a construct. What does that mean? Don't put locking screws in everything. You put locking screws in everything, proximally and distally. You create too stiff of a construct, and you increase the, 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 the uh, the, the, the forces on the construct and you can get a non-union. So do put some cortical screws in the area. Also try to avoid locking screws on your most distal aspect of the shaft because you can get a stress rise or try and put a, a, a cortical screw in that area. So here's a patient with a, a two-week-old four-part proximal humerus fracture. She's 52 years of age. So using my previous uh, a thought process, I've elevated the head through her fracture plane. Here's the defect, there's the head. There I'm elevating the head. So now that the tuberosities are sitting in proper position, I've reduced that large greater tuberosity piece with a lag screw. So the head is now back in the position, the calcar is reduced, there's bone graft under that area, and now I just put a plate of appropriate length with good calcar screws to maintain the neck shaft angle and the tuberosities and the sagittal alignment. So what do I do? I try to reconstruct as many as I can. I use the appropriate surgical techniques we've talked about. I use reverses for select elderly patients with three and four part fractures or fracture instability and I use slow post-op rehab to ensure re uh, healing, especially in the elderly patients. So in conclusions, locking plate has allowed for evolution of treatment. There's less shoulder orthoplasty with locking plates. Reduction is still clinical. It's the Indian, not the arrow. Respect your relationships and do not perform an, o an OIF. So when talking about humeral shaft fracture cases, here's a patient with a uh, short oblique spiral mid-shaft humerus fracture. Here they are at three months. They haven't healed, so we put a nice plate on this area. The reduction looks fairly good. Here we are at eight months. Looks great. You're doing great. You look wonderful, but they still kind of have that medial area that's not healing. At 18 months, it fails. So why does it fail? Is it a failure of biology? Was the patient infected? Or do we not use a large enough implant? So avoiding fixation failure in shaft fractures. ORIF is the gold standard. A large 4.5 broad LCDCP plate or a narrow a uh, 4.5 plate is appropriate. When you're doing these shaft fractures, you want to do at least six to eight cortices above and below. You can augment these patients that have difficult fracture patterns with bone graft, struts, or an additional plate. I love doing orthogonal plating techniques. Remember the biology and your approach is important. If there's, if there's distal extension, you may want to go lateral or posterolateral. lateral. Uh, also, the approach will allow you to put augments on that area. Distal thirds, treat it more like an elbow and not like a shaft. Double plating technique is what you need to do, and don't be afraid. What does that mean? Don't be a lazy man orthopedist. Don't put a rod in something that doesn't need a rod. If you have a distal third fracture, expose it properly. Put in hardware that's necessary. If you have a posterior fracture, if you have a fracture that requires a posterior approach, don't be afraid to expose the radial nerve. Expose the radial nerve, fix the fracture properly, let them heal. Do not be afraid to do what you're trained to do, which is be a surgeon. So here we have a patient with a double plate. So here's a patient with a Humeral shaft fracture approached posteriorly. We've exposed the radial nerve. Now we know the fracture is put together beautifully. We have a nice large 4.5 plate, enough cortices above and below, and we've gotten union from that area. So here's a patient that we saw before that failed her fixation. She had a 3.5 plate. So how do we revise it? We put a, a medial strut. We compressed across that fracture. We put a nice large 4.5 broad plate augmenting our repair with, with cortices above and below to give us compression and the appropriate stiffness to heal this fracture. So here's a 27-year-old male pro, pro motocross patient who had a spiral fracture distal third of the humerus. Do we treat this like a humeral shaft or like an elbow? Bad fracture. My preference is double plating of these patients, 90-90 or parallel. We got nice union. So remember, the distal third fractures are much more like elbows, 90-90, uh, or parallel plating is what you need to do. So why did this fracture failure, 62-year-old? Is it a failure of biology, or was it because they used a 3-5 plate and they didn't get great cortices above and below the area?
So this is how we revised it. Large plate, 4.5, medial strut, enough screws above and below to compress across and to hold this fracture stable. So in conclusion, use appropriate size plates. You need to have enough cortices above and below the fracture. Distal fractures are more like an elbow. Your approach is paramount to treating these injuries, and do not be afraid to do the right thing and do what you are trained to do, which is be an orthopedic surgeon. And I thank you.